This is Jerry Seib with the Wall Street Journal. I'm joined by David Wessel and today Kurt Campbell, who was until recently the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, now head of the Asia Group, and a guy who's watched the North Koreans up close for a while. Um, they're pretty interesting this week, Kurt. A uh, lot of bellicose words, yeah. some bellicose actions, some firm American responses. I guess my first question is, are we seeing anything that's out of the ordinary from the North Koreans, or is this the same old stuff? Yeah, well, thanks. It's great to be with you guys. You. Appreciate uh, the chance to chat, and it's a challenge, again, always dealing with our uh, North Korean interlocutors. I think two things happened yesterday that were significant that I would watch carefully. Uh, obviously, the North Koreans are putting out a daily barrage of provocations. Today, it was the closing down of this joint uh, uh, commercial facility in North Korea. Yesterday, it was another ren renunciation of the armistice between uh, South Korea and uh, the North. But if you look carefully at the White House statement, basically what the White House said is, look, we take very seriously these uh, uh, statements and these uh, very uh, sort of alarming rhetorical flourishes. However, if you look carefully, very little has changed militarily. Almost no units are on a higher state of alert. There are a few. Well, on the North Korean side. Yeah, on the North Korean side. We're on a very high level. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of leaves have been canceled in South Korea. We've moved ships, artillery, battalions, everything to uh, support our effort on the Korean Peninsula. But the North Koreans have been very careful. So they know exactly how to walk right up to the wire, but then not trigger a crisis. The problem is that people forget that this is the most militarized place on the planet, and it has been for 60 years. And one misunderstanding, one miscalculation could lead to just a tragedy. And what's happening in South Korea is that in the past, South Koreans have been very content to allow these kind of pokes like this on mm -hmm. a daily basis. Mm -hmm. South Koreans have gotten very close to saying, I I'm not going to take it anymore. And there is the very real chance at some point that an incident or an accident create, could create a miscalculation with, with terrible consequences. So the United States is trying carefully mm -hmm. to smooth uh, uh, some of the waters in the South. Well, what's the point of all this military might by the U.S., the flying, the stealth, and all that? Well, well, look, you know, you've got to send a strong message of deterrence that North Korea cannot contemplate that they would get away with anything um, that would be perceived as a threat to the South. And that has been an enduring quality of American diplomacy for decades. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important. It, it underscores our commitment to peace and stability, and it's part of what makes us a great power in Asia. And it sends a very clear message to China that they need to get uh, their friends in Pyongyang. We well, want to ask about China in a minute, yeah. but let me let me um, ask one other question first. You have on the scene right now, in this picture, you're talking about several new factors. Mm -hmm. You've got a new leader in North Korea, yeah. obviously a new young leader in North Korea. You've got a new government in South Korea and a new government taking shape in China. Are those all factors? In other words, are the North Koreans doing some of this because they're sending signals to mm -hmm. new actors on the stage around them? I think that is part of the uh, equation. In addition to that, we have a new government in Japan as well, and obviously they have an interest on the, uh, on the peninsula. The irony, though, uh, Jerry, is that we have a situation for the first time in a long time, a leader in South Korea, very sophisticated, very worldly, Madam Park, who has made it clear in private meetings, I was there in the delegation that greeted her uh, in her transition, that she wanted to begin a process of dialogue with North Korea. Mm -hmm. And we were ironing out how that process would take place. And of course, then North Korea mm -hmm. proceeds to actually undermine the political support in South Korea for such an endeavor. Ultimately, I believe she'll try to find a way in the months to come to reach out to North Korea. But with each activity of the North Koreans, missiles, uh, nuclear tests, provocation, uh, they undermine yeah. the confidence of Western democracies in South Korea and the United States and Japan that anything can be accomplished. And so they've put themselves in a very difficult but circumstance. Their, their pattern over time has been to go through that process and then at the end of it say, okay, so what's in it for us? Exactly. But, but what's happening on, uh, and I saw it myself very clearly in government, it's, you know, it's the rarest of people that says, hey, send me into that you know, <laughs> uh, thicket, right? And yeah. so, so political leaders have to calculate 
the risks. Remember the last time we got very close to an agreement, this leap year agreement, our very able diplomat, Glenn Davies, negotiated it. Very tough, very hard uh, one uh, diplomatic achievement. And then the North Koreans go home, their diplomatic team, basically were immediately undermined by this new leader. The, the problem with um, uh, the new leader is, first of all, we know almost nothing about him. Um, that's not unique for uh, yeah. North Korean leaders. But he, he is clearly unpredictable. Um, and uh, he is uh, using pages of the old playbook, but then adding other pages from Disney World and other <laughs> things. And, and it has left everyone, including uh, our friends in Beijing, very much on edge. Well, let's talk about our friends in Beijing. Yeah. How do you think this looks to them? Are they in control of the situation? Oh, or? heavens no. They're extremely anxious. And what's their interest, in slowing down this Korea thing or in I keeping mean, us at bay? Uh, well, look, their primary interest is the maintenance of peace and stability on the peninsula and to keep what they would conceive as a buffer state in place in North Korea. Our line always to them was, if this is a buffer state, you know, <coughs> what, what good is it, right? North Korea has done so many things that are antithetical to China's foreign policy and national security interests. China cannot be happy with the really massive show of force that we're seeing building on the Korean Peninsula, United States, South Korea, support from other nations, because of the actions that North Korea has taken. Um, increasingly, China's trade links, their political dialogue is more with the South. What we have seen is a rather almost bizarre political set of interactions between China and North Korea. If you witness those interactions, you would be, uh, frankly, in a difficult place to try to figure out who is the great power, who is the smaller power. China is extremely careful, very polite. They practice a very gentle brand of diplomacy, quite contrary to what they've done with Japan or the Philippines or Vietnam in certain circumstances. And I think what's happening in Beijing now is they're starting to reevaluate. Has this approach served our interests? And I wouldn't be at all surprised in the coming months to see a tougher line mm. from Beijing, i.e., you better get your act together. They could turn out the lights in North Korea if they wanted, couldn't they? They could shut the place down overnight if they wanted to. But again, what would happen then? It could create instability on the Korean Peninsula. In a, in a sense, the North Koreans have figured out China's bottom line, and they're testing China as much as they're testing South Korea and the United but, States. But let's step back. Mm -hmm. I've, I've wondered for a while now whether the Chinese thinking about the Korean Peninsula isn't about 20 years out of date, which is to say their fear is that a unified Korean Peninsula would be, would produce A, uh, an influx of refugees amidst the chaos that would uh, ensue, yeah. and B, would produce a U.S., heavily armed U.S. satellite on its southern border. Does that really, is that really the way they ought to think about this now? Well, look, you know, I, th I think you could argue that w there, I there are generational divides on the Korean Peninsula. So some of the people that I have dealt with, for instance, that are at the tail end of their diplomatic careers, I won't name names, I could sense very clearly that their heart was, shall we say, in the Korean War, right? The sense of <laughs> camaraderie, camaraderie yeah. and support for their uh, communist brethren in the North. A different, younger generation takes a more pragmatic and I think in some respects calculating view and recognizes that, that shall we say, that this uh, leadership is out of step right. with uh, the trends in Northeast Asia. I, I think uh, ultimately the lines point to China reevaluating and thinking more clearly over time what their strategic interests said. The, 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 the challenge here, though, is that both South Korea and the United States have approached China to talk about the future of the Korean Peninsula. But for a whole host of reasons, uh, WikiLeaks, uh, you know, anxiety about talking about really challenging issues, we've never really been able to have that dialogue, mm -hmm. to really talk about the future and what fundamentally are in China's interests. We've done a little bit in sort of track two and academic, but not uh, in the appropriate high-level councils of government, Clearly which is going to be necessary. I think that's a conversation that needs to happen. Look, we had some of those conversations in the 1990s, mm -hmm. um, but in recent years we have not. But I, I, I have to underscore, uh, it's, it's imperative that the United States and China 
work together and to find a way forward uh, uh, to share uh, in the peace and prosperity of the Asian Pacific region. In my interactions with even the most worldly Chinese interlocutors, underneath it is still, or growing, a very substantial distrust of the United States. And they worry that some of these you know, uh, gambits are staged by the United States to put pressure on China. And so it will not be an easy decision for them to put North Korea uh, uh, under pressure mm -hmm. because they are worried. Uh, th they would almost prefer to deal with the difficulties that they know, i.e. a very provocative leadership in the North, than those that they don't know that could come from unification. Can I ask you Please. one question more about China mm -hmm. and about us in China? The Chinese have been doing a lot of hacking of American computers, gotten yeah. a lot of attention. What do you think is going through the minds of the Chinese leadership now, and what should be the American response? Well, first of all, I, I alert you to some of the statements that the President made, uh, the National Security Advisor, uh, Tom Donilon. The, the irony here, um, David, is that in China's actions are actually the seeds of the strategy to go at China. W what, what is the most important prime directive of Chinese foreign policy? Do not take actions that allow a collective group to stand against you, right? And by their, frankly, just random, indiscriminate attacks against businesses, against commercial entities, against governments. Press. Don't forget against the press. The press. <laughs> That's right. Yes, of course, you guys. Uh, uh, they have created common cause among countries who would just, frankly, just as soon not have a problem with China. So they united their enemies. Well, or uh, it's Adversary. not just their enemies. No, it's, they've united a group of nations m and entities, many of which who want good relations with China. And so they're all coming to China saying, you've got to stop this now, right? Uh, on top of that, I think they have miscalculated with respect to the American business community. What is happening in the American business community, who has always been the ballast in the U.S.-China relationship, right? They're the ones that have helped us through the rough seas. Uh, as a, you know, a middle-level official at the State Department, one of my jobs was to meet incoming American executives who wanted to talk about China. And I grew up as a Catholic. It was very much like confessional. They'd come <laughs> in, they'd come in, and they'd say, "Look, we we have some problems," and we'd ask, "What is? What are they?" And the, you know, massive problems of you know, corporate issues of governance and you know, intellectual property and worried about you know, work share and money, everything. And what became clear is that every American firm really is feeling some pressure right now. And so if they're not careful, they will alienate the very group inside the U.S. government, inside the U.S. Uh, economy, government circles that advocate for a strong U.S.-China relationship. Kirk Campbell, interesting times in Asia. Not likely to get less so. Hope we can continue to talk about it. Meantime, next week, the budget wars return to Washington, and we'll be back here at Saib and Wessel to talk about them. Hope you'll join us. And in the meantime, you can join the conversation on Twitter at hashtag WSJLive. I'm Jerry Saib.